This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. We'll be exploring the fascinating world of gravitational waves today. They form the basis of how we currently comprehend the structure of the universe and Einstein's general theory of relativity. In essence, gravitational waves are rippling in the space-time fabric brought on by some of the universe's most destructive and energetic phenomena. To better understand this idea, picture throwing a pebble into a motionless pond. The stone causes the still water to move, creating ripples that resemble gravitational waves. However, we're dealing with the very fabric of space-time, not water. Although Einstein's theory of gravity predicted gravitational waves in 1916, it wasn't until 2016 that these waves were first directly observed by the LIGO and Virgo observatories. The team was awarded the Nobel Prize for the finding, which ushers in a new age in observational astronomy. We took so long to get there, yet it was such a huge accomplishment. This clearly illustrates how elusive and subtle these waves are. New methods for seeing the universe have been made possible by the direct observation of gravitational waves. For instance, electromagnetic radiation has traditionally been used to study black holes, which are among the universe's most puzzling objects. However, when they collide, they can also send shock waves through space-time, producing gravitational waves that we can now see. In addition to carrying data that can't otherwise be retrieved, gravitational waves also carry information about their origins and the makeup of gravity. They are so important in our quest to understand the cosmos's mysteries for this reason. They can be compared to a fresh perception a fresh way of seeing the cosmos. Even while we've made amazing progress in the study of gravitational waves, we still know very little about them. Each new discovery advances our understanding of the universe. The science of gravitational waves, their detection, and its ramifications will be covered in this course. Together, let's explore the uncharted, because that is where real learning happens. What is the main idea of the lecture? When were gravitational waves first directly detected? What is the professor's attitude towards the study of gravitational waves?
What did the professor mean when they said? Let's explore the uncharted because that is where real learning happens. What implication can be drawn from the professor's statement? This clearly illustrates how elusive and subtle these waves are. Why does the professor say? They can be compared to a fresh perception, a fresh way of seeing the cosmos. Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, Professor. I've heard about the possibility of participating in research opportunities as an undergraduate. Could you tell me more about this? Absolutely. Conducting research as an undergraduate is a wonderful opportunity. It can help you develop critical thinking skills, and it's also a valuable addition to your academic portfolio. That sounds interesting. But how can I get involved? Are there specific programs or professors I should reach out to? Yes, there are several ways. Some departments have established undergraduate research programs, and professors often have projects that could use an extra set of hands. Additionally, you might consider applying for research grants or scholarships. Wow, that sounds like a lot of options. But what if I don't have any previous research experience? Would that affect my chances? Not necessarily. Professors understand that undergraduates might not have much prior experience. They're often looking for dedication and a willingness to learn more than anything else. I see. I'm a bit nervous, though. Do you think I could manage it along with my coursework? It can be challenging, yes, but. Many students successfully balance research with their studies. Plus, research can often complement your coursework, deepening your understanding of the subjects you're studying. What is the main topic of the dialogue? According to the professor, how can a student get involved in undergraduate research? The professor implies that
How does the professor feel about the student's ability to balance research with coursework? How does the professor view the potential benefits of participating in undergraduate research? Now listen to the lecture. Although the idea of renewable energy is one we are all familiar with, the science underlying these energy sources is sometimes disregarded. Let's start with solar power, which is produced by harnessing the sun's rays. Electricity is produced when electrons in a semiconductor material are excited by sunlight impacting on a photovoltaic cell. The photoelectric effect a key idea in quantum physics, serves as the foundation for this theory. A crucial topic of continuing research is the effectiveness of these cells. Let's look at wind energy next. The kinetic energy of the wind is converted by wind turbines into mechanical energy, which is then converted into electrical energy. We can better comprehend why wind blows faster at higher altitudes, effectively pushing the turbines, thanks to Bernoulli's principle, a concept from fluid dynamics. Predicting wind patterns and maximizing turbine design for maximum energy capture are difficult tasks. On the other hand, hydroelectric power utilizes the potential energy of water that is stored in dams. When discharged, the kinetic energy of this water drives turbines to produce power. The law of conservation of energy is the main physics principle at play here. Geothermal energy uses the thermal energy that is contained in the crust of the Earth to generate steam that powers turbines. We take advantage of the natural heat gradient, where temperature rises with depth. Thermodynamics and concepts of heat transmission are used in this process. As we've seen, every renewable energy source is based on a particular set of physical laws. All of them, nevertheless, have one thing in common. They use the Earth's natural processes to create clean, sustainable energy. Let's not overlook the difficulties posed by renewable energy, though. Since the light doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't constantly blow, intermittency problems present a substantial challenge. The distribution and storage of the energy produced by these sources pose additional technological and infrastructure difficulties. While the physics of renewable energy is complex and fascinating, it also necessitates our creative problem solving in order to get over the obstacles it faces and fully achieve its promise. What is the main idea of the lecture? According to the professor, what principle is key to understanding hydroelectric power?
How does the professor feel about the challenges associated with renewable energy? What deeper meaning can be inferred when the professor says? All of them, nevertheless, have one thing in common. They use the Earth's natural processes to create clean, sustainable energy. What is the professor implying when discussing the intermittency issues of renewable energy? Why does the professor mention the concept of the heat gradient in relation to geothermal energy? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I have some concerns about job interviews. Could you help me? Of course. I'd be happy to help. What specific concerns do you have? I tend to get extremely nervous and can't articulate my thoughts well. It's completely normal to feel nervous. Preparation is key to handle those nerves. Do you practice before interviews? I do, but I feel like it's not enough. Let's consider a different approach. Instead of just preparing for general questions, try to anticipate specific questions based on the job you're applying for. That sounds like a good idea, but what if I don't know much about the company or the role? Research is essential. Learn as much as you can about the company and the role. It demonstrates interest and initiative. I see. I will definitely do more research in the future. Great. Also remember, it's not just about answering questions. You should also ask relevant questions to show your interest in the job. Hmm. I never thought of it that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Now go out there and conquer your interviews. What is the main purpose of this dialogue? What does the career counselor imply when they say? Instead of just preparing for general questions, try to anticipate specific questions based on the job you're applying for.
In the dialogue, why does the career counselor emphasize the importance of researching the company and the role? What does the career counselor mean when they say? You should also ask relevant questions to show your interest in the job. How does the student feel towards the end of the conversation? Now listen to the lecture. The fundamental concept of meteorology, weather, is the state of the atmosphere at a certain place in time. It includes elements like temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and atmospheric pressure. Our daily activities are shaped and greatly impacted by these dynamic factors. The climate, on the other hand, is a considerably bigger puzzle than the weather. Climate is the average of a region's long-term weather trends, often calculated over a period of 30 years. It resembles a big story told via the transitory incidents of each day's weather. Extreme weather events are our third topic today. These are weather occurrences that are unusual, severe, or out of the ordinary for natural changes. They include, among other things, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and heat waves. Our comprehension of these events is essential because the frequency and intensity of them depend on numerous variables. It's interesting how much weather and climate affect our lives, even if we have no direct control over them. We don't lead in our relationship with weather and climate, but we must follow carefully to keep from stumbling. Last but not least, while weather, climate, and severe events are at the heart of meteorology, fascinating subjects like celestial navigation, and the Earth's geological age do not always fit under the umbrella of meteorology. What is the main idea of the lecture? Which of the following does not belong to the study of meteorology as mentioned in the lecture? How does the professor feel about the relationship between humans and weather?
What does the professor mean when he says? We don't lead our relationship with weather and climate, but we must follow carefully to keep from stumbling. What is the professor implying when saying? Climate is the average of a region's long-term weather trends, often calculated over a period of 30 years. Why does the professor mention celestial navigation and the geological age of Earth in the lecture? 